and we're now going to join the United States Co Military Court of Appeals. Court of Military Appeals. Court of Military Appeals as it hears the case of U.S. v. Curtis. Taylor, we uh, have on the screen the courtroom. Apparently, they haven't begun yet. And it looks like we're looking, are we not, at the appellant table? Yes, I believe that's true. The table closest to the, the, the front camera is the appellant. And then the government is represented on the other side. And we know that um, the chief justice, or the chief judge, has not entered yet because. If he has, you'd see the As appellant. I mentioned earlier, they, they will all enter at the same, at mm -hmm. the same time, the three judges. Now, ordinarily, the... Section 8, clauses 12, 13, and 14 establish a congressionally controlled military in our society. Specifically, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 14 says that Congress has the power to make rules and regulations for the government of the land and naval forces. The American executive would never be like the British monarch. The monarch had the power to raise armies. The American executive would never have such a power. Holmes stated, the provisions of our Constitution are transplanted from English soil. To understand their history is to understand their significance. This case presents two tensions, the tension between soldier and citizen. The issue is, what rights a citizen accused of a capital offense has in the military. Equally important is the tension between the president as commander-in-chief and the Congress as c controlling the rules and re regulations of the military. The issue is who decides what service members the state can execute for a peacetime offense of Article 118.1. Our position is very simple. The Constitution establishes congressional control over the military. Congress alone balances individual constitutional rights and military necessity. Congress decides what rights service members receive. Congress has decided that in capital cases, Supreme Court precedent should apply. Congress also must decide what service members the state can execute. Congress has not decided. Congress has not delegated this power to the president. The, what the president has done in RCM 1004 is an impermissible exercise of presidential power. In summary, there are two sources of authority that support our argument. First of all, legal authority, and secondly, history. I would invite the court to consider a visual display which we submit presents squarely the issue before the court. This visual display represents the constitutional concept of narrowing. That's the first of two constitutional requirements with respect to any death penalty legislation. First of all, the offenses must be narrowed. The triangle, the inverted triangle, represents all in the class of 118 offenders. The most significant part of the chart is the black line across the middle. The question is, who draws the line? We submit that only Congress can draw the line. Only Congress can define those citizens that the state can execute. That decision cannot be made unilaterally by the president. So the key is, who draws the line? There is no question that the line must be drawn. In the uh, appellee's brief, they concede, we've cited the law appropriately, there must be narrowing. Let me ask you this, Commander Holt. In uh, 1985, Congress adopted uh, Articles 106A of the Uniform Code, which prov provides that uh, the line is drawn to a certain extent by Congress, but also says that in drawing the line, the President may promulgate regulations setting forth aggravating factors. Now there, there is a specific delegation of authority from the U.S. Congress to the President to do the line drawing that you speak of, at least in certain respects. Is it your position that provision is unconstitutional? Uh, 
Is it our position that 106A is unconstitutional yeah, or the delegation of the president? There's a delegation provision therein. Uh, that issue is not before four. the court, but we submit that that delegation is unconstitutional. May I tell the court why? Best seen by comparing 106A with 118. As the, judge, as the chief judge points out, Congress has drawn the line. And what Congress did in 106A is they specifically narrowed the, the, SB, the class of espionage offenders. The triangle now represents espionage offenders. They narrowed the espionage offenders so that only four particular classifications of uh, espionage offenders were in the red area, the death eligible area. Those offenders were uh, espionage that related to nuclear weaponry, military spacecraft or satellites, early warning systems. Secondly, war plans. Third, communications or intelligence or cryptographic uh, information. And fourth, other major weapon systems. So what Congress did in 106A, as the chief judge points out, is distinctly different than what they did in 118. Well, I realize that, but didn't they also have something about regulations that the president uh, may prescribe? Aren't there additional aggravating factors that could substitute for the ones you just mentioned? But the, but the significant point is, is that the president was given authority under 106A in Section 3 to establish an aggravator with respect to those citizens already in the death eligible classification. Congress had already exercised its, its authority to specifically narrow the class, and that's what's not been done. So the, 10, uh, the 106A aggravator that the president was authorized to promulgate it, it, uh, is, is distinctly different than what the president has done here. And most importantly is that uh, we would submit that the aggravator established in 106A is unconstitutional under Mistretta. Uh, Mistretta footnote 11 specifically uh, uh, contrast uh, the type of delegation that we see in uh, uh, Article 36 with the type of delegation that was upheld in Mistretta. In, in Mistretta, the court identified the goals, the tools, and uh, uh, the purposes of the uh, delegation. In this particular regard, uh, 106A, the aggravator, does not establish anything at all with respect to guidance for the president in uh, 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 establishing uh, a particular aggravating factor. But wouldn't your argument have carried to a logical conclusion indicate that uh, the table of maximum punishments prescribed by the president is unconstitutional, and yet that's been with us for, what, 90 years without any serious attack? Uh, no, Mr. Chief Justice, the table of maximum punishments is distinctly different because there's a specific delegation to the president in Article 56 to establish the table of maximum punishments. But there is no outlining of policy or purposes of the sort that you said would be required under Mistretta. But the president long has had authority to establish uh, particular types of punishments with respect to military discipline. He's never had that authority to establish the category of offenders that would be executed as, uh, 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 for capital offenses. Uh, I would submit to the court that it wasn't until the 1890s, if I'm not mistaken, that the first authority for the president to do so was, was, was established. And more significantly is if you go back from 1775, the president never has had authority to establish the class of citizens that would be subject to death. Even antecedent to the, uh, dec uh, to the uh, Declaration of Independence, the Constitutional uh, uh, Congress uh, established in 1775 in Article L of the Articles of War, 1775, that those citizens that would be subject to death were only those citizens where it was expressly authorized in the Articles of War. That was reaffirmed in 1776, 1786, 19, uh, excuse me, 1806, and 1874. Four subsequent provisions to 1775 reaffirmed the fundamental premise that it would be the Congress that would maintain exclusive control of defining the class of citizens that would be executed. Uh, I think I'd submit to the court that that's manifest in the present code in Article 18. Article 18 says that a general court-martial has jurisdiction to try fences and impose punishments. And then it says, including death, when, the critical word is when, specifically authorized by these articles. It didn't say when the president could do it, and the president had never done it before. Well, but other... Article 18 also says uh, a general court-martial may under such limitations as the president may prescribe a judge any sentence not forbidden by this chapter, including the penalty of death. So it seems like Congress in Article 18 uh, does permit uh, the, the president to get involved in, in the procedures and the, uh, and the perhaps narrowing for, for the death penalty. Uh, 
Judge Sullivan, with, with respect to that language, I would submit that the full context, though, is to finish it. And that is, it says, including the punishment of death when specifically authorized. The, the, the critical words... But it says, yeah, well, let's, let's complete your completion there, because it says, when specifically authorized by this chapter. Now, this chapter also is, that's the Uniform Code of Military Justice. This chapter also has Article 36. It says uh, the president may prescribe rules, uh, pretrial, trial, and post-trial procedures uh, for cases arising under this chapter, which is the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And it says that all these rules and regulations shall be uniform. And it also goes on in the B section to say it shall be reported to Congress. So it seems like Congress made a knowing delegation and they put a provision in there where these rules would be reported to them. So if they were not happy, they would change it. They would change it. And as you know, there's been no change. There, there are two significant points. One is that uh, uh, the Article 36 provision only gives the president authority to establish procedures. And here, the problem of defining the class of citizens in a particular group under 118.1 is not a procedure. It's been referred to as a guideline, a, a, uh, um, a criteria, a standard, but whatever word you put on it, uh, it's even been called an element of the offense, but whatever word you put on it, it's clearly a, a, a policy decision. And a policy decision is not a procedure. The president basically has taken 10 people. Let's use 10 as an example. And he said numbers 1, 3, 5, and 7 are death eligible, and 2, 4, 6, and 8 are not death eligible. He has defined, by drawing the black line, particular groups. He hasn't established a procedure that, that, that someone else uh, 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 would, be, uh, would be in the context and uh, uh, format of uh, previous uh, uh, presidential action under Article 36. Now, there are three branches of government. Uh, the, uh, the judicial branch of government, the Supreme Court in Parker versus Levy, said that the military is a unique society. Uh, the Constitution, the, the part you, you, you quoted earlier in your argument about Article I, says that Congress shall have the right uh, to make rules for the government and regulation of the land and naval forces. And, uh, but inherent in that, also in the Constitution, in Article II, is the fact that the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Now, I think Congress, when, they, or when the Constitution was made, uh, and, and we have the best Constitution in the world, but they knew that sh there should be interaction between the branches of government. And I think with the basis of the Commander-in-Chief and the rules and regulations, I don't think it's beyond the scope of possibility when they, in, when they formed the Constitution that they would foresee something like this where they delegate a power to the president who was the uh, head of the uh, executive branch, the one who's probably better qualified to set out these rules or narrowing than any of the other branches. So uh, can you address yourself to that, the, the president's power under Article II, and why he is not the, why it's, it's not a logical interaction between the, the three branches of government that they say that you should be killed. Congress says uh, there is a death penalty for premeditated murder, and that and the president under uh, 1004 gets to define or narrowing the offenses. We said at the thre threshold of our argument that there's the tension between the uh, provision of Article One and uh, the uh, matters in Article Two referring to chief executive. But uh, uh, we would submit to the court that uh, uh, what's what's most disconcerting with the uh, appellee's brief is they've come back in the new reply brief and attempted to establish the authority for the president to act as the authority as commander in chief unilaterally. Uh, as your question points out, this is not an Article II exclusive matter. It's an Article I matter. And that is, the, if the president is going to rely on anything, he must establish his authority to act pursuant to a delegation. For the president to attempt to justify what he has done in this particular context as exercise of his Article II powers 
is an abuse of that uh, power as it's been uh, long defined. Uh, I would invite the court to the uh, uh, 1853 Attorney General opinion. Uh, in, uh, in, we append it to, as an appendix to our brief. In 1853, the President of the United States attempted to establish rules and regulations for the Navy. A young fledgling uh, country still, uh, he wanted to take control and establish some things. In literally a matter of days from the time he established his uh, uh, voluminous uh, rules and regulations, the Attorney General told him it was violati violative of the Constitution. Uh, specifically, the Attorney General told the President it was not within his powers as Commander-in-Chief. And that opinion does two things, the Attorney General's opinion. It reaffirms the fundamental factor of the Cong Congress's control of the military. And secondly, it, it again goes to history, and it goes to the British experience. And it establishes, even in the parliamentary experience since 1688, the parliament has had control of the military in Britain. The monarch no longer does. Who and makes the regulations for the Navy today? The, the Congress of the United States makes the regulations. They may, and it's significant, they may explicitly delegate power to the president. Haven't they done that? Uh, no, they have not. That, that's that's the key, a key provision of the Article I argument. There has been no express delegation. I ask, I ask, uh, the Navy regulations, doesn't the Secretary of the Navy uh, have Secretary of Navy regulations? Uh, are you talking, I thought you were talking about court-martial uh, No, matters. no, no, just regulations in total. Well, the Secretary of the Navy does establish regulations. And he does uh, that uh, pursuant to the presidential power of Commander-in-Chief. That's right, but he does not establish regulations relating to uh, uh, provisions of court martial, of courts martial, and I, I'm not. Uh, I'd submit to the court that we'd have to look real carefully as to the authority for the secretary to establish the regulations, even with respect to the uh, uh, regulations for the navy. I haven't well, looked. That's not I, an I focused, issue here. I focused my research on the yeah. authority of the president to establish regulations with respect to uh, mm -hmm. courts martial, and uh, uh, it's been long-standing Supreme Court precedent that the, pre the, the Congress alone has authority to establish rules and regulations. Judge Cox, in his law review article, when he traced the historical roots of the, uh, of, of the court martial system, uh, goes back and cites the Supreme Court precedent since the 1860s that says that the Congress has the power to establish the uh, military justice system. And so... Uh, uh, well, uh, uh, that's a law. The, the Uniform Code of Military Justice is a law. We're getting into the regulation area now. And my point here is, is why, why under the law, if, if Congress says, uh, gives, says that the president shall make procedural regulations under, uh, under 36, Article 36, why is it not, why is it an improper delegation from Congress uh, when he def uh, the president defines certain offenses uh, as being death penalty? One, the president is, president is given authority under Article 36 to establish procedures. This is not a procedure. What he has done is define the members of our society which the state can execute. That is not a procedure. That is substance. You would say, for example, that the president's <clears throat> establishing a requirement of proof beyond reasonable doubt in lieu of preponderance of evidence. That would be procedural. That, that's that exactly the, right. The aggravating factor yeah, the line drawing, that goes beyond uh, procedure and becomes something else. Is that your basic position? That's our, that's our, that's our basic premise. And what, what we look at to distinguish what, whether it's a procedure or not, let's look at the impact, the oper oper operative effect. And what he is doing when he draws the line in this particular context is he's defining a class of citizens that are death eligible. That's well, the that, fundamental client, result. Did your client not commit premeditated murder of two people? My client was convicted of those offenses, yes. All right, he stands convicted under law today before this court of two murders. Uh, yes, uh, but and, I... And did not Congress say that uh, the penalty for premeditated murder is death? Congress in 1951 stated that the penalty for premeditated murder was death. This court in Matthews and, uh, has uh, stated, though, that uh, that was an overbroad classification. On page 379 of the Matthews opinion, and I read, the government contends the court member's finding that the murder was premeditated narrows the class of murderers subject to capital punishment to whatever extent may be required by Zant v. Stevens. Then the key words, we disagree. 
The court went further to say that 118.1 parallels numerous statutes struck down in Furman and its companions. And most significantly, what shows that the present narrowing is improper is the president himself has come in and tried to remedy the situation drawing the line. After Matthews, after Furman, everyone knew that 118.1 was too narrow. And the president came in and said, I'll draw the line. I'll take the initiative and I'll define the... Per the, the, well, the, the regulation system. has the effect of law. Is that correct? It has... It is law. Yes. RCM 1004 is the law of the land. I mean... Well, it, it's, the president's, it's the president's executive but, but order. But it has the force of law. It has the force of law, and that's what this, uh, that's yeah. what this court is to review. Okay. Commander Hope, why does it matter? Why does it matter that the president drew the line if the line that he drew accurately uh, in compliance with Supreme Court precedents narrows the eligible service members according to Supreme Court standards? I mean, uh, Congress, as you pointed out, since 1775 has authorized the death penalty in appropriate cases. The United States Supreme Court has said only certain cases are appropriate. Now, if the president has a correctly identified those appropriate cases, haven't we done everything that can be done under the law? Uh, Judge Cox, uh, your question goes to basically one word. Are we talking about a technicality? Are we talking about it really doesn't matter who draws the line as long as the line is drawn fairly? Well, Congress has clearly said that under the Uniform Code of Military Justice and the preceding Articles of War, that in the opinion of Congress, the death penalty is necessary to carry uh, further uh, military discipline. Uh, I have some serious reservations about that apropos the Marine Corps and being necessary in the Marine Corps, but that's a different issue. But uh, Congress has never backed away from the idea that the death penalty can be imposed under a uniform code of military justice. Now the question is, if the president has correctly identified those people who are eligible, does, shouldn't that not only satisfy Congress, but satisfy the people of the United States and the Constitution and the Supreme Court and everyone else? The question presupposes that the president has done it correctly. And, and how I can we... presuppose that. I ask you, shouldn't we focus our attention? Has the president done it correctly? Uh, You're trying to say the president can't do it. Uh, uh, and I'm asking you, if the president can do it, has he done it correctly? It's not this court's province to question whether or not the, qu the president has done it correctly. It's the court's concern whether or not the president had authority to do it. Because so we should assume that if we conclude he had authority, he did do it correctly. Uh, if you presuppose that the president had authority, then, then the question will become, did the president do it correctly? And uh, we're, Mr. Morin's going to address some specific areas where the president failed to exercise okay, his, well, delegated, I'll, I'll uh, his alleged de delegated okay. authority. Now, the, the areas uh, he addresses are addressed in our brief in terms of identifying the particular people. In other words, whether the aggravators are rational, is that, is that the concern? What if the president had said, notwithstanding the authority vested in me by Congress, I don't believe the death penalty is appropriate in peacetime and therefore it's not authorized. Would he have the power to do that? Obviously, he could do it by pardon. You know, he could accomplish it, but could he do it by withdrawing from the court-martial the power to, to carry it out in any circumstance. Uh, I, we would submit that the president exercising his powers at that regard could uh, uh, obviate uh, any referral uh, capital. He certainly could do that. It's one thing for the president to decide that citizens can't be exercised, but we'd say that he has a clemency power and he can accomplish exactly the same result. But it's another thing for the president to say which citizens can be executed. That's an altogether different decision. While he has authority to remove people from the class, he doesn't have authority to put people in the class. Well, could Congress take away the president's power as commander-in-chief to have that clemency? Could Congress say that the following very narrow, death-eligible people who are sentenced to die by court-martial will die, and the president shall not exercise any clemency? That would go to the inherent power of the president to exercise his clemency power, but uh, I would submit that uh, uh, in light of the fact that the Constitution establishes rules and regulations for the government of the military, that if the, Const if, if the Congress so stated, that, that that would be binding on the president. They would remove his power to exercise executive clemency in particular articles, and uh, therefore that would be binding. It, it goes back, uh, 
your, your premise to the, the fundamental concern of the authority of the Congress to establish the rules and regulations. And we would submit that Solario again reaffirms that it's the Congress of the United States that's going to decide the jurisdiction of court martials, the, uh, the uh, authority of court martials, the punishment of court martials, and particularly what class of citizens can be executed. Did, did um, now the, the president in RCM uh, 1004 did narrow, did draw the line and, and make some people death eligible and some not death eligible, did he? Is it, is it your view that if Congress had done the same thing, that would be fine? Uh, if, I, if I may. In other words, did, did the president act arbitrarily or capriciously or not pursuant to Supreme Court precedents uh, when he defined the class that would be eligible? Well, that, that's really not the question, uh, Judge Sullivan. If I, if I may, that we put before the court presently, uh, it, it sh this court should not be engaged in a dialogue or evaluation of whether the president did something uh, validly or arbitrarily. The, the first, the threshold question is the government must establish the authority of the president to act. That authority must be either under Article 2, which you and I discussed earlier, is not a proper authority, or mm -hmm. Article 1 pursuant to a specific delegation. Once the government does that, then we can go to the next question. But the, the, the square issue before the court now is the authority for the president to draw the line. And I submit to the court that... Well, we would have to overrule Matthews to say he didn't, wouldn't we? No, we wouldn't have to overrule Matthews in order to prevail. Uh, specifically, the issue in Matthews uh, was not the issue before the court. Who could draw this line, who can narrow the class, was not the issue in Matthews. Matthews decided whether or not there was individualized sentencing. It focused on whether the uh, 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 sentencing mechanism was constitutionally sound. And, and this court said in Matthews that it was deficient. The court in Matthews said what the government couldn't do in 1983. It said you cannot execute a citizen because the statute is defective. It did not say what you can do. Uh, we would submit that uh, uh, significantly uh, Judge Fletcher, uh, in his concurring opinion, specifically pointed out that was not before the court. And uh, a, a very significant dimension of Matthews is that uh, uh, I lost my thought just a minute. The, uh, um, You'd characterize it all as dictum, that portion of the opinion, wouldn't you? We could characterize it as dictum, but the more significant, <laughs> thank you, Judge Everett, the more, significant, the more significant point, though, in Matthews is that Matthews addressed procedures. And that was my thought, that the, the court in Matthews reaffirmed the president's authority pursuant to Article 36 to establish procedures, but it did not establish the president's authority to establish an aggravator or narrow the class. So, uh, in recapitulating briefly, Matthews does not ha is not precedent. It did not decide the question. The issue was not before Matthews, and Matthews addressed only the uh, establishment of procedures. These are not procedures. Then, as I understand your brief, uh, you contend that under Mistretta, I guess this was Albert's, uh, Judge Albertson's position, under Mistretta, which was handed down in 1989, which we did not have available in Matthews, there have been some requirements which were not complied with. Is that part of it, too? Judge Everett Mistretta is the key, uh, is another key with respect to Matthews. I, I, I failed to mention that one. That was the next point. And that Mistretta, subsequent to Matthews, does give this court specific guidance with respect to the type of delegation. And the court uh, uh, not, not having the issue b before the court in Matthews that's presently before the court, uh, in good faith, tried to evaluate uh, an issue to uh, identify an aspect of the case. but. But uh, uh, definitely Mistrada wasn't there. And Mistrada says specifically, again, the type of delegation that must be done. We would contrast the delegation in Mistrada, where purposes, tools, and goals are identified with the absolute uh, uh, no delegation to the president in this regard. But in, in Mistrada, on page, uh, and I'm reading from uh, 109 Supreme Court 659, uh, quoting Madison, the Supreme Court says, separation of powers, he wrote, meaning Madison, does not mean that these three departments uh, have no partial agency in or control over the acts of the others. And it goes on in the next paragraph to say, in adopting this flexible understanding of separation of powers, we simply have recognized Madison's teaching that uh, the accumulation of, of excessive authority in a single branch 
is not what the Constitution was all about. Uh, in other words, there's an interplay between the three branches of government. And why, I find it hard to understand why Congress can't say, well, you, the military can have, has the death penalty for murder, and, and it, it further narrows it for premeditated murder, and then it turns over de a delegation power to the Article II Commander-in-Chief in saying, you know, and you shall to make rules to, to carry out these. I find it hard to believe that uh, Madison and, and the Supreme Court in Mistrata uh, didn't say that this may be an appropriate delegation of power. The, the, the language in the pages you cite come from the opinion of Mistrata that addressed separation of powers argument. Yes. The, the critical provision is the delegation question. The court addressed the history and the delegation question first, found an appropriate delegation, and then on, went on to the separation of powers argument. Yes. Our concern and the, the critical distinction is, is there has been no delegation. We're not past footnote 11. Footnote 11 in Mistrata says that there must be substantial guidance. What is the substantial guidance with respect to the president in, if he has a delegated authority to uh, uh, narrow the class? What, what guidance is there at all? There's no guidance in the code. Well, th there's the guidance that murder is, 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 is punishable by death. There's the, the premeditated murder. And there's the guidance that Congress says uh, they set up the court martial system uh, to have a jury, a judge, and, the, and they said that the president can have a role in, in, in making uh, a working the rules for the court martial. What more guidance would you want Congress to give them? We would submit that guidance from Congress should be specific as it is in Mistrata with respect to death penalty, what particular offenders, the purposes, the goals, the types of offenders that can be uh, uh, executed and are specifically in the, in the identified class. Well, you're almost going to a micromanagement uh, uh, theory uh, that... But... I still think that under the, the separation of powers that, that it, there can be an interchange between the powers uh, in order to uh, accomplish the rule, uh, the rule of law pertaining to this case. Your reading of Mistretta is exactly right. There can be an interchange of powers when there is an express delegation and an explicit delegation, and here there is not. You're saying thir uh, Article 36 is not... It, Article 36 is a delegation, but it's not, it's a procedural rather than a substantive one. Judge Sullivan, let's contrast Article 36 with Article 106A. As Judge Everett pointed out at the top of the opinion, 106A is an express delegation. Whether or not that's constitutional under Mistretta is another question. But there's no question at all that that was the congressional intent in 106A, is to give the power of the authority, uh, the president the authority to establish, establish an aggravator. And if the Congress of this, of this country wants a death penalty in the military, they know how to do it. They've done it historically, and we submit that they should do it again. A, a very important dimension that the court shouldn't overlook is the dimension of uh, the legislative history of 106A. The government relies very heavily under the le on the legislative history of 106A. Our, our position on that, very briefly, is, is the legislative history is a declaration of congressional neutrality. The debate that goes on now in the courts unequivocally occurred in the Congress of the United States four years ago. It was clear that the President of the United States could not get a death penalty through the House Judiciary Committee. 106A did not go through the conventional legislative process. It was a rider to a DO, it was part of a DOD authorization bill. And it was the only time the Congress of this country has voted on a death penalty in the military since 1951. If the President wants a death penalty, he can go through the Congress and get a death penalty. But he has chosen not to do that. And you, Wait a and you think that the uh, Furman v. Georgia and the Supreme Court precedent require, as Colonel Albertson alluded to in her dissent, that requires the Congress of the United States to make this decision? Uh, unequivocally. And that 215 years of experience in this country under a death penalty in the armed forces does not give us any guidance whatsoever? 215 years of the death penalty in the armed forces establish congressional control of but don't the don't forget definitely. the one thing that we keep overlooking here is what Judge Sullivan pointed out to earlier from Parker v. Levy, the linkage between military discipline and the commander-in-chief authorizing punishment to enhance discipline. And uh, 
Congress sets the boundaries, but the President decides what, he's, what is necessary to accomplish it. It seems like uh, that's been clear throughout the history of the country. I if, if the president believes that discipline is necessary, if the death penalty is a necessary ingredient for discipline, he has to go to the Congress and the Congress must unequivocally expressly authorize him the authority to establish a death penalty. He can't say, I believe a death penalty is appropriate. The Constitution says that the Congress must do that. Congress has said that. The Con Congress has said that throughout the history. I mean, it's never backed away from a death penalty under a a, a uniform code or articles of war anywhere else has. Uh, Judge Cox, since 1775, the death penalty has been in the articles of war. But the point is, is that if you look from 1775, it's always been expressly authorized, expressly authorized by the Congress. That's the key word. It, it, it seems like it's more than fortuitous that even in Matthews, when we were talking about the, what the president could do, before the, uh, the, the word expressly authorized is even used in Matthews. In summary, we would submit that uh, the, who draws the line is the question. Uh, it's the power of the Congress to draw the line. It's in the Constitution. It's been reaffirmed in history. We ask this court to issue an opinion that reaffirms that important constitutional concept. Thank you. Mr. Morton will now address other dimensions of our case. Mr. Morton, I gather you're going to concentrate on RCM 1004. That's correct, Your Honor. May it please the court, Chief Judge Everett. Uh, if this court either decides a delegation issue against our position or decides not to reach it, we would submit that there are facial problems with RCM, I'll call it 1004, uh, which uh, arise facially and which we think uh, renders RCM 1004 facially unconstitutional, otherwise un uh, unauthorized by law. Uh, we've submitted three primary arguments in support of this position each of which I'd like to touch on today. Essentially, the first argument I would like to touch on uh, is that the Supreme Court has recognized, and it's clear uh, from the cases, and we do not dispute that a sovereignty, in this case the military, can decide that a judge can be the ultimate sentencer. The judge can make findings with regard to aggravating circumstances, mitigating circumstances, and determine whether or not the death sentence is appropriate. So you, and, could, you could have a judge completely without a, a jury as far correct. as sentencing, so long as he made particular findings correct. on aggravating factors. And that, and, and the Supreme Court has clearly said that is a constitutional, there's nothing constitutionally inf uh, infirm about that procedure. It bases that decision, and I'm not going to argue with the presumption in, in, in advancing my argument, that a judge has special knowledge, experience, makes decisions about sentences all the time, essentially has the community come before it in some sort of forum uh, uh, on case after case, and is in a unique position to make what the court would call a non-arbitrary uh, decision regarding death. In fact, the Supreme Court has indicated that a judge could actually be more consistent in their application of the death penalty, and that's why they didn't find it constitutional. So I recognize that a judge sentencing approach is, a, is constitutional, and I don't argue with that. And isn't it true also that in some of the states, a judge can impose a death sentence even over a recommendation for There are the president. states, there's three states with a jury override, but again, that, uh, and I think that's uh, Alabama, Florida, and one other state that doesn't come to mind. But then again, what the jury does is, is they just give input into the judge's decision. The judge still has to go through the legal decision-making uh, process de novo and independently. They consider the jury verdict, but it's an independent judicial decision. The question arises is when you remove that decision-making ability from a judge and put it in some sort of representative pool, and the civilian uh, capacity would be, <coughs> excuse me, a jury, represented by a jury, and this would be members of the court-martial. When you do that, is there some sort of minimal number which a capital defendant is entitled to, whose life, life or death, is going to be decided. Is there a minimal number to which he or she is entitled? And our position is, yes, there is, by history, by sort of societal consensus today, without exception, that minimal number is 12. And again, I think it's important to note that when 
the, the law pres uh, we would submit, uh, the, that's an important number because it, it, it represents a broad cross-section of whatever community you wish to represent, in this case, the military, that when you start removing members from that panel and get it down to five, in this case, nine, you're removing the ability of the capital defendant to present whatever mitigating circumstances or reason for a life sentence. Well, in, in the magic number 12, related to the Sixth Amendment guarantee of jury trial to an accused, and hasn't it been held since the Milligan case, really in 1866, that courts martial are not subject to a jury trial requirement? I, I, and I recognize that point. Uh, and and the, what I stress in the brief, and, and what I would like the court to look at, it, is the Eighth Amendment analysis. Because unlike an analysis under the Sixth and Fifth Amendment, where the court essentially goes back and looks at the framers' intent. The court's obligation, constitutional obligation, is somewhat different and unique under the Eighth Amendment, that you look at ongoing developments in societal norms with regard to capital procedures and the substance of capital punishment. That, in fact, you look at uh, societal consensus and formulating under the Eighth Amendment what may or may not be constitutional at a given time in our country's history. So that uh, what may be cruel and unusual punishment today for the purposes of the Eighth Amendment might not have been in uh, Exactly. I mean, I think that's the history of the Eighth Amendment. And so when you look under the Eighth Amendment and its requirement for a reliable determination as to sentence, one of the things the, court, the Supreme Court has instructed courts to do is you look at whether there's a consensus legislatively among all the states as to a particular procedure or punishment. And I would say that, that they are no, uh, they're no more unanimous on this issue than any other issue in, in capital punishment. Uh, Is it fair to have 12 or 9 on a capital jury? Well, and, for you. Right. I, I would say, uh, taking out a terminology of fairness, uh, I would say the constitutional requirement is 12. Uh, and where do position. you find that constitutional requirement of 12? Again, our analysis is primarily based on the court's, uh, Supreme Court's determination that number one, uh, you must have a reliable determination as to sentencing. And you don't think a determination by nine individuals uh, is a intelligent but a re reasonable determination? I, I, I would say this, Your Honor. I, I'm not saying in some given case. I, I don't know whether 9 or 12 may or may not disagree as to a particular disposition. Uh, that's not the analysis you undertake, I believe, under the Eighth Amendment. You look at whether or not there's a societal consensus on a given point. And the societal consensus, at least at, with respect to jury sentences, is no less than 12. Well, now, Congress has said that uh, court marshals can be from five upwards. Correct. OK. And, uh, and Congress has also said that uh, capital punishment in the law, and, and I'm talking about Article 55, it says cruel and unusual punishment is prohibited. And it doesn't list death there. Matter of fact, in, it provides for death in other portions of the code. And, and so uh, hasn't Congress at least spoken that, in their view, this is not cruel and unusual punishment, and, and sentencing by nine in this case is appropriate? Well, I, I would just suggest, uh, Judge I mean, Sullivan. this is, yeah, this, this court follows the law rather than makes the law. Correct. I, I understand the court's point. I would say, with respect to the minimum number, Congress certainly hasn't uh, revisited that issue since Furman or since uh, the developments in the Eighth Amendment. So it's not, and when they have revisited the, that issue uh, with respect at least to uh, federal criminal jurisprudence, they provided for a jury of, uh, of 12 members. But I would also submit to the court that Assume the, uh, your question is correct, that Congress has made that determination. It's the law. I mean, right. we're reading I understand the law. that. Yeah. I understand that. 
But your obligation under the Eighth Amendment is not to say, well, that's the law, that's where our analysis stops. You have to determine whether or not that law comports with Eighth Amendment principles. And that's what we're suggesting. Even if Congress had made a deliberate determination uh, that that's what they wanted to do, which we suggest is not mm -hmm. real clear, that doesn't absolve this court of the Eighth Amendment inquiry. Well, why not? Why stop it? at 12. Why not go to 13 or 15? The first trial in America, according to an article by my brother, uh, Judge Cox, uh, indicated that uh, Thomas Hickey was executed in, in the year 1776. Uh, this probably is the first federal trial in America. And, and he was tried by 13 officers. 13, well, why is that? Well, it goes back to the Articles of War, 1775. 13 was kept up in 1776. And, I mean, isn't, uh, as the Supreme Court has said, 12, the number 12, a historical accident? And why, if it's a historical accident, should it be determinative today in the case before us? Well. It may or may not be, uh, first of all, I'm not, I'm arguing a minimum number of 12. I'm not arguing against 13, so I wouldn't be advancing this argument on behalf of uh, Mr. Hickey. Yeah. Um, I, I'm suggesting that there's a societal consensus with regard to a minimum number. Uh, I think also, again, under the Eighth Amendment, you look at a, a, what the court has called evolving standards of decency. Has it evolved to the point, the societal judgment evolved to the point where the court can say, this is what our society has decided? And the societal judgment, at least with respect to this issue, seems to be a minimum of 12. And it's important to note that the court has recognized that a jury in a capital sentencing, and why probably there should be broad uh, representation, uh, a jury and a capital sentencing, it, it's more than just legal determination. The court has described it as a moral, reasoned response by the community. It, it's a community reaction to, and judgment on a particular crime. Not always legal in nature. The, the, there's a nature of moral judgment to it. And so that's why I think when you lessen the number, uh, you deprive a capital defendant of, of very substantial import consideration uh, and why we would suggest that 12 should be the minimum number. I have a recollection that when the uh, Supreme Court decided Gideon against Wainwright, Justice Clark said there was no uh, capital, non-capital distinction in the Constitution, but uh, you would suggest, I gather, that the history since Furman indicates pretty clearly that capital cases are unique. That's a, a, and let me just take <coughs> two minutes on uh, uh, two cases, Ballou versus Georgia and Williams versus Florida, which the Supreme Court seems to indicate in non-capital cases, a minimum number of six is appropriate. Uh, clearly in Williams, Williams. versus Florida case. Right. And, and, and Williams, they clearly said, separate and apart, everybody agrees, at least the states agree, that 12 is a minimum number. But in Williams versus Florida and Ballou versus Georgia, they said six is good. We're going to draw the line at six. I would suggest the determination, and one of the reasons they said that is because the determination of guilt innocence by a jury is significantly different than that which it faces at the sentencing phase. And guilt or innocence is determined, they look at the evidence and determine whether or not the prosecution had met its standard of proof. There's no sort of community input like that into that. There's, there's a legal judgment they make, factual judgment. Whereas when you get into the realm of capital sentencing, it's much more than that. It's, it's uh, Justice Rehnquist in Barclay says, we, we don't expect individual, uh, or the sentences to remove their sort of personal history and community moral values when they come into the sentencing deliberation. And that's why I would suggest at least with respect to capital sentencing, that circumstance is dramatically different. Well, what about the other two? I'm sorry. I was going to ask the same question. Uh, the other two, two issues? Points, okay. Yeah. Uh, regardless of the number you choose uh, uh, as to the minimum number, we would suggest that if you're dealing with non-judges, uh, 
the sentencing, capital sentencing jury must be specifically and adequately instructed as to each facet of the sentencing procedure. And this goes to the issue where we submit RCM 1004 does not require the sentencer and each panel member to be instructed that they need not agree unanimously as to a particular mitigating circumstance before that mitigating circumstance is weighed in the final weighing process. This and is to avoid the confusion that, that apparently existed in the North Carolina procedure. And that's correct. It, it, it stems from two cases, Mills versus Maryland and McCoy versus North Carolina. Uh, let's just follow what happened in this case as an example. Here the jury was instructed that they had to unanimously decide on guilt or innocence. They had to unanimously decide as to the existence of an aggravating circumstance. They had to unanimously decide that aggravating circumstances outweighed mitigating circumstances before a sentence of death could be imposed. But then they were given no instruction, no guidance on what, if any, decision they had to make with regard to a particular mitigating circumstance. Did it have to be unanimous? Did it not have to be unanimous? No instruction whatsoever. And the government's position has been, well, see, we didn't give them a wrong instruction. We just didn't give them any instruction. So therefore, it's constitutional. And we would submit that the Eighth Amendment requires more than that, that the jury has to be told that they need not agree on a particular mitigating circumstance before the individual member decides does this aggravating circumstance outweigh the mitigating circumstance I have found? And 1004 is deficient that it doesn't give any guidance on how to do at this? At all, at all. And, and nor was any saving instruction given in this particular case. That's why we raise it. Uh, it wasn't cured in any way. Doesn't, isn't there a difference, though, between aggravating factors, which are used as a line drawing criterion, and mitigating circumstances, which is, can be just sort of a, uh, an aggregate of circumstances where, the, uh, where one uh, member of the, uh, of the court martial panel may think one circumstance is important and should be considered. I mean, what is mitigating there again? It's that's, very much that's left That's the, the whole point. See, aggravating circumstances essentially under RCM 1004, and we don't argue with this as a constitutional matter, have to be unanim unanimously agreed upon. Mitigating circumstances do not. Jury is given guidance with respect to aggravating, but none with respect to mitigating. Isn't that work for the benefit of the accused, though, that uh, it's an idea that the defense can throw in the kitchen sink if necessary, and that all of that is to be taken into account, but that ultimately there has to be a unanimous decision. I believe it is unanimous requirement that aggravating outweighs mitigating. Isn't that the big thing? That's but the, the question in that final thing is, is, is what are they considering mitigating? Is it uh, the mitigating circumstances they have unanimously found, they've, told they, they've been told they have to unanimously make a finding with respect to each and every other issue. But if 11 of the jurors, that was the issue that was faced in Mills and, and McCoy, if 11 of the jurors agree that a particular mitigating circumstance exists and is so weight, weighty that it justifies a life sentence, but one does not agree, under those statutory schemes, they couldn't weigh the mitigating circumstance. So you, you would suggest that under the RCM 1004, there's a potential that the court members, having been instructed about unanimity for aggravating considerations, might infer uh, that they had to be unanimous on mitigating circumstances. Uh, it's not just aggravating. They're instructed as to una uh, unanimous agreement as to virtually every issue in the capital case. And then they're... they're the court is silent, RCM 1004 silent, with respect to mitigating circumstances. And we would submit that under the Eighth Amendment, it, it's, in order to be constitutional, there must be more than silence. There has to be some clear, adequate, and specific instruction on that matter. Wasn't there specific instruction on extenuating the mitigating circumstances in this case at the record paid H-22? 825. As to what were mitigating circumstances and mm -hmm. what could be 
presented in this, this case. This is the judge giving instructions. Correct. You must also consider all matters in extenuation and mitigation and balance them against the aggravating factors using the test I have previously instructed you on. And it goes on to state, uh, as you're aware, the accused is a re relatively young man, 20 high school graduate, goes on, three years service, his, goes into his, his family background, goes into his um, activities in the church, including the choir. This is all, in, and it says he has no criminal record. These are all instructed to the jury in this case. That's why I, I tried to make clear in my case that our attack on RCM 1004 is, is not that it prevents the presentation of mitigation evidence. No, we don't contend that. The question is, by being silent as to what mitigating evidence could be considered, does it have to be unanimous agreement as to it? Can an individual juror decide that, okay, fine, the family circumstances are important mitigating circumstances to me. I'm going to weigh that heavily. And can other jurors then say, well, we don't agree with that, so you can't weigh it. They're given no instruction or clarity with respect to that final weighing uh, circumstance. Does there have to be agreement on the mitigating circumstances? Well, they're saying, uh, they're instructed that you have to balance these. You have to consider, but it doesn't say what agreement you need. And in other words, the Supreme Court has said, and other federal circuits have said, what is mitigating in one case may not be mitigating in another case. Mitigating is in the eye of the beholder. So you can have disagreements about whether or not a particular circumstance is mitigating by different people looking at it. And again, you know, the prime example often given is if a defendant comes from a, a very good family, good family upbringing, strong family, never been convicted before in his life. Some defendants would offer that up as a mitigating circumstance. Other jurors may consider that aggravating. There was no need to get involved in a capital murder. You came from a good family. You've never been in trouble before. You didn't have the trouble. So again, it's in the eye of the beholder. And unless you have a clear instruction that you, the individual member, make the determination as to the mitigating circumstances. Not you, the, jur the, the panel members as a whole, but you, the individual member, must make that determination. Well, let me ask you, in terms of how it works in the, in the jury deliberations, basically, of the court martial deliberations, they have to have a vote unanimously on aggravating factors. Correct. There is no vote uh, even suggested on mitigating circumstances. Correct. So wouldn't the normal inference of a juror, uh, a member of the court, be they didn't have to have any determination on that issue and that they would move from the vote on individual aggravating factors which they ultimately report on to the court in their findings to the aggravation versus mitigating? I would suggest that that's contrary to the experience of other legislatures. Even in Georgia, uh, which is ver uh, we suggest very similar, as a matter of course, the standard instruction is that the juries are told that each must decide as to each individual uh, mitigating circumstance and that they must be unanimous and that they need not agree and in fact uh, they're further instructed that they they may uh, each juror may have a reason to impose the life sentence or need not have a reason at all it's up to that individual juror I would also just uh, that's what I was going to ask you does the instruction here permit the court-martial if they even if they agree beyond a reasonable doubt the existence of the aggravating factors and they agree beyond any reasonable doubt that there are no mitigating factors. They nevertheless can vote not to impose capital punishment. I don't, are they instructed to that? Uh, th that would be called the so-called life option, which is available in, in many states. And uh, I just didn't see that in RCM 1004. Uh, it's a strict weighing statute. In other words, they weigh, and if aggravators outweigh, they impose death. Uh, very much like Maryland in that, that respect. There's no third inquiry. Is that? In your, uh, in your contention, would that be uh, fatal to 1004? I, I wish I could argue that, but the law is against me as to whether or not a life option is constitutionally required. I'm not advancing that argument here. Uh, again, it's uh, more with respect to what decision has to be made with regard to the existence of a mitigating circumstance. And if you I could just get... You don't that a life option instruction is mandatory constitutionally? No, I've just... Okay. I've lost that in too many courts to argue it here. <laughs> Uh, 
Um, I, I would just, just to get back to the Chief Judge's question, I would also indicate that, uh, as we indicated under the um, sort of the drug kingpin death penalty, as it's known, uh, 21 U.S.C. Section 848K, there's a specific provision in that statute, which I would call a Mills-McCoy provision, where the jury, each jury member is told, the federal law requires that the jury members be told that they, the decision about the existence of mitigating circumstances is an individual decision. So it's an ex express provision in the other federal law. Which is that section? Uh, 21 U.S.C. Section 848K. It's the Omnibus Drug Initiative Act. Uh, we cited in our brief uh, at page 51. I have very little time left, but I, I would just uh, move very quickly to the uh, third uh, point we raised in our brief, and that is uh, we believe that there should be uh, either constitutionally required or, or as a matter of supervisory power by this court, some sort of meaningful appellate review of the appropriateness of the death penalty and whether or not it's arbitrary. And by that we mean comparative. Uh, do you compare it to other sentences to, as the Supreme Court said in Gregg versus Georgia, make sure that this is not an aberration. This argument is, is advanced in sort of a factual setting, whereas I understand it, the death penalty in the Marines hasn't been imposed in 140 years or some, some amount of years like that. And secondly, it's, it's done with the backdrop that in Matthews, this court in 1983 made clear that it would require that type of review. I see my time is up. And our, our contention is RC 1004 does not, has not followed the dictates of Matthews. But doesn't Article 66 pretty much adopt that as a carte blanche for review of every military conviction? Well, I, all I would suggest is if you look at the type of review that was undertaken in this case in the, in the court below, it was not the type of meaningful appellate review that is... Well, like you pointed out, there's obviously nothing to compare it with. I mean, the Chief Judge Burns' dissent started out. Well... He said that uh, there'd been no death penalty imposed in the Marine Corps, I forget, since 1817 or something like that, and See, that, he didn't think this was appropriate to be the first case. Right. That's, that's pretty comparing it, isn't it? Well, it, it's certainly comparing it to, to um, other cases in which, I, if you limit your uh, um, hemisphere of comparison to only where ca cases where the death penalty is imposed, yes, there's nothing to I'm compare sorry. it to. But you never have a death penalty. Co correct. There's always got to be somebody first. But you look, and we suggest, compare it to where it wasn't imposed and see whether this is an aberration. We're saying as a matter of supervisory power, however this court may wish to dictate it, it should be dictated as part of the procedures of RCM And that would not really invalidate RCM 1004. That would be something that would really, uh, in the truth, that would be a matter of whether it should be remanded to the intermediate court for further review. There, there certainly would be, and, and I didn't, I, I understand mm -hmm. the court's question. I, I'm not really arguing, we're saying RC 1004, RCM 1004 has to be at least supplemented by that. Uh, if this court feels it has the power to do it, I'm certainly not going to argue uh, with this court ordering of it. Uh, but again, uh, so I have noticed some state statutes uh, require a review I forget the Latin term, in forum vitae, vitae, something like that. A uh, sui sponte review of a, a death case. A, a de novo. Oh, virtually all states require automatic appeal to the highest uh, court. But I mean, they have to review it not only based upon the briefs, but they have to review it. De novo, court. independent review, independent. Uh, is that constitutionally mandated? Or is that just what a lot well, of states have Well, uh, most states require it. Uh, I would cite, as we attempted uh, to, uh, there's a case we have to deal with on our side called Pulley versus Harris, mentioned in our case, in our brief. And there the Supreme Court said, if you have other checks and balances against arbitrariness, as you do in California, sort of a unique system, then you may not need the type of review I'm, I'm advancing to the court. But you look at the particular sen uh, sentencing structure of your jur jurisdiction, and we would submit, for the reasons we stated in that brief, that this court should <coughs> order it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moore.
We'll hear now from the government. Good morning, Your Honors. May it please the Court, my name is Major Miller. Lieutenant Commander Muskamp and I will be representing the government in this case where the appellant has been convicted of two premeditated murders and sentenced to death. Lieutenant Commander Muskamp will address the second specified issue regarding the facial constitutionality of Rule 1004. I will be addressing the first specified issue, the President's authority to promulgate Rule 1004. Now, appellant contends that the President does not have this authority, that only Congress may formulate capital sentencing procedures for the military. However, this argument is at odds with the opinions of the Supreme Court and of this Court that Congress may delegate legislative authority, including authority over the implementation of criminal sentences when appropriate to a mission of another branch of government. As Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, the President is an appropriate agent to receive congressional delegations of authority with respect to the military and has constitutionally received such authority under the Uniform Code. Now, first, I'd like to address the separation of powers. We have to distinguish here between... It's, it's uninjured, I think. I think between... <laughs> between uh, governmental action by one branch, which encroaches upon or aggrandizes power at the expense of another, and a non-aggrandizing action, such as a delegation of legislative authority. Now... Well, let's assume that you... Uh, have no separation of powers problem as such. Isn't there still in the Mistretta case a uh, requirement of delegation pursuant to certain guidelines? As I recall, they distinguished the Panama refining case on which uh, Judge Albertson uh, relied in her dissent in this case. Uh, but if I remember Mistretta, the uh, statute which established the Sentencing Guidelines Commission had a number of uh, of criteria, policy statements, and findings. Uh, and that apparently was very significant from the Supreme Court standpoint in finding that the delegation was permissible. Uh, is there guidance of that type available in this instance? Did the President uh, have the standards and the policies to, to guide him in the line drawing exercise that he accomplished? In the first instance, I would, I would like to uh, address one thing first, Your Honor. We don't read Mistretta as establishing a floor above which, you know, below which a delegation cannot be made with respect to criminal sentencing. It doesn't state that at all. And a matter of fact, the court went through a whole list of cases indicating that power may be delegated under broad standards. One of, one of the cases that cited was Yakis. And in Yakis, the court stated, that only in the absence of standards for the guidance of agency action so that it would be impossible to ascertain the will of con that the will of Congress has been, been obeyed may a court strike it down. It well, also the, I, I think we can agree with you that cases like Iacus uh, and Lichter have very broad delegation. Uh, Bowles v. Willingham back during OPA days in the end of World War II. But what are the standards here? Well, the, Congress prescribed. Oh, the, sta the standards that Congress prescribed are those found in Article 36 with respect to the procedures which, which govern in the United States di district courts. And we would submit that that is a much more uh, stringent um, uh, circumscribing of the President's power than, say, was, it was had in Lichter or Yaukas. Well, I can see how for certain, for, for procedural guidance, <clears throat> Uh, the rules followed in the federal courts, federal district courts, and the principles of the common law would be of great assistance. But I'm concerned with that standard as it applies here, because uh, for the most part, there is not much federal legislation dealing with death penalties. I think you've got it for skyjacking, certain types of uh, drug abuse uh, offenses, uh, espionage. Uh, but that would tend to suggest that you look to those statutes, is that it? Oh, no, sir. No, sir, not at all. We would submit that, that you look not only to what, what Congress has, has, has laid down, but also to what the Supreme Court has stated with, with respect to the de death penalty. These all would be controlling in the district courts. But I, have not, I, I do not recall any specific Supreme Court decision on the death penalty where the Supreme Court said X is an appropriate factor you know, where the Supreme Court said, we're determining 
that a certain thing is an appropriate aggravating factor. Every case I'm familiar with has involved a state prescribed uh, criterion, an aggravating factor of one sort or another. I don't remember the Supreme Court ever prescribing an aggravating factor, but maybe you can tell me of such a case. No, there is not, no cases of, of that magnitude. But then we go back again to what Congress's intent was with, with respect to this. If I may uh, make one other point, I don't recall in this case, Your Honor, that there was any objection made to the constitutionality of any of the aggravating factors. So in that sense, I would submit that maybe the issue isn't before for this court. But well, it would be sort of bad in a death case to say that the accused had waived a fundamental constitutional problem. Well, that's, issue, yes, that's it? true, Your Honor. But um, uh, it wasn't something that has been specifically addressed at any level. And if, if with the court's permission, uh, uh, we uh, would be agreeable to submitting a sub supplementary brief on that point if the court desires. Well, I think we'll just hear from you. We've got so many briefs in this case. <laughs> we to keep it straight. I, Major, I am, what I'm concerned about in this case is back to a real, what I think is just a baseline, fundamental purpose of military justice and, and the Uniform Code. It's my recollection that the Uniform Code of Military Justice authorizes the death penalty in and a substantial number of offenses, uh, cowardness before the enemy and desertion before the enemy and that sort of things as well as what, rape and skyjacking and espionage and many other things. And in none of these which have been on the statutes of the United States for centuries in one form or another, has Congress ever come up with any aggravating circumstances or aggravating factors or anything of that nature, have they? That is correct, Your Honor. And throughout the history that has been left up to court martial and to the Commander-in-Chief to decide when it's necessary to ensure good order and discipline of the armed forces around the world. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Now, as I understand the defense argument, since Furman v. Georgia, in order for, the, for a court-martial to impose a death penalty upon a military member, Congress had to revisit and decide if it was appropriate in that particular case and give the circumstances in which it was, they had to narrow it to the exact circumstances which it was appropriate in that case. Is that the argument? That's the argument, Your Honor. Okay. Now, it's the government's position that the president can narrow that for Congress. Is that correct? That is correct, Your Honor. And that's really what the first issue is all about. Yes, Your Honor. And Mastrata really doesn't help us there, does it? Oh, I think it does, Your Honor, in footnote how, how 11. How could that help us? There's been, no, uh, there's been no express delegation here. That's At true. At least but I haven't a, found anything that says the president shall set the aggravating factors for death penalties in the seven or eight of charged offenses in which they are appropriate, and under whether wartime or whether peacetime and so on and so forth. We would submit, Your Honor, that the delegations can be both implicit and explicit. There's a great body of law which says that presidential actions which are not objected to by Congress over a long period of time are acquiesced in by Congress. And when you stop and think about it, since the code was passed in 1950, that's 40 years ago, the, the president has made rules not only with respect to procedures, I mean, there have been three manuals and changes to every one of the, the ma manuals. They have been reported to Congress under Article 36B, and Congress has not objected, which is evidence that this, that this presidential action comports with what the, the, the Congress intended. Moreover, going back to 106A, they have, they have expressly indicated that, that the president has acted within his delegated authority under Article 36 by not only in the, in the very last uh, sub uh, subsection of the article indicating that the, con that the president may, may prescribe uh, additional aggravating factors, but also in the legislative history where Congress specifically stated that, that this article was not to at all affect the, the, the validity of RCM 1004 with respect to the other capital offenses under the code. Moreover, well, I guess what concerns me about this whole thing is the Eighth Amendment, the cruel and unusual punishment aspect of, of capital punishment. Yes, sir. Uh, as I understand the whole scheme of military discipline, it is necessary to have an, a disciplined armed force, one that can go to war and obey orders. 
Uh, and Solario, we found out, overruling O'Callaghan, that the Supreme Court considers all offenses enhancement of military discipline, as I, as I read Solario. Now, should the president be required to make a finding that capital punishment and under certain circumstances, or Congress should be required to make finding, capital punishment under cir some circumstances enhances discipline? Now, it get, what troubles me is that the Marine Corps since 1817 has not found it necessary to impose death penalty to enhance discipline in the Marine Corps. And I'm having trouble uh, finding out how this particular case contributes to the enhancement of morale and discipline in the Marine Corps, because if it doesn't, it seems like it'd be cruel and unusual and would exceed the President's authority. Well, Your Honor. Am I making sense with that argument? Well, <laughs> it, it takes a new spin on the Eighth Amendment argument, as I well, understand it. Let's say, let's say if punishment is not necessary, wouldn't you consider it be cruel and unusual? If it's not necessary to vindicate some societal right or some, and in most states and most societies think that death penalty is necessary to vindicate some societal purpose. Yes, Your Honor. You agree with that? Yes, Your Honor. Now, shouldn't the Congress have to decide that at peacetime, of Marines at Camp Lejeune or some of those similarly situated, it is necessary to vindicate some societal norm of privilege or right in the Marine Corps in order for us to find it not cruel and unusual? Or can the President make that decision? In the first instance, Congress made the decision, and it's been, it's been making the decision now for 215 years, that death is appropriate for murder. And in the aftermath of Furman, they did nothing to change that. As a matter in 106A, in fact, they reaffirmed it in the legislative history. Uh, there's no constitutional requirement that every time there's a change in the law under the Constitution, as comes down from the Supreme Court, that Congress must run and look at every appropriate statute and reaffirm its intent one way or the other. It may be better that way, and the better is always the enemy of the good, but it's not a constitutional requirement. The fact that it's still there, and in 106A, in the legislative history, Congress specifically stated and emphasized that it wasn't supposed to affect the validity of Rule 1004 or the other capital offenses. In fact, 106A is supposed to be implemented in a manner consistent with 1004. Congress is speaking. That's what we would submit. We would also... 106A, if I may just ask you. Does the president have the right to promulgate aggravating factors in addition to the aggravating factors that Congress prescribed? Under 106A? Yeah. With respect to that offense, yes, Your Honor. Okay, so there is that specific delegation there. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor, we would, we would submit that. Moreover, we would say that Mistretta is instructive on this case. Footnote 11 states that, the, that Congress may delegate the, author, the authority to formulate capital sentencing guidelines so long as Congress in the first instance authorized the death penalty. Now, recalling, recalling the, uh, the uh, appellant's exhibit there, okay, that's perfectly appropriate if we were in the state of Louisiana because that's a guilt phase narrowing scheme as in Louisiana, but that's not the kind of scheme, a sentencing stage scheme, which exists here in the military and in the vast majority of states and in the Anti-Hijacking Act and the Omnibus uh, uh, Drug Act and all that, all that other. The vast majority of states narrow at the sentencing stage. So the appellant's um, exhibit there is somewhat misleading or at least or at the, to be kinder. Uh, mistaken. The narrowing occurs in our system in a sentencing stage um, a narrowing scheme after the defendant in the initially has been convicted of an offense to which the death penalty is attached as a punishment. Okay, so the Let way I would modify, you. yes, Your Honor, I'm sorry. I, I, this is the first case we've had uh, under RCM 1004 
uh, we've considered in, in any detail. I wonder if you could sort of explain to me how it actually works. You're talking about the guilt stage and the sentencing stage. The aggravating factors under RCM 1004 are actually set forth in the original charge. Is that right? No, they are not, Your Honor. They are not. They are not. The way it works is this. They are not set out as elements of the offense because they're not elements of the offense. Okay? The way that the uh, defense is made aware that the uh, prosecution intends to go forward with capital sentencing if he's convicted is by notifying the defense prior to trial of the aggravating factors they would intend to prove at the sentencing stage. I see. So that only, that does not come up at all before? That does not show up on the charge sheet at all, Your Honor. And my recollection is that under the table of maximum punishments for certain instances of aggravation, let's say driving drunk when someone is injured, all of that is put in the original charge, the aggravating factor, and then the, uh, the court martial in its initial findings makes a finding as to that particular element. That is correct, but, Your Honor. But this is different. This is, this this is, is different. This yes. is notice. So in this instance, uh, he was tried for two murders, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. And tried jointly, the, the husband and the wife, uh, the murder of the husband and wife. Then after the, uh, the court martial had unanimously returned findings of guilt, then they proceed on to the aggravating factors of which the accused and his counsel have already been notified. That is correct, Your Honor. And the evidence comes in on those. That is correct. And the, the aggravating factors here were what? Uh... The aggravating factors here, Your Honor, were with respect to the um, murder of Lieutenant Lotz, it was the murder of his wife, Mrs. Lotz. With respect to the murder of Mrs. Lotz, the there were two aggravating factors. The murder of Lieutenant Lotz, and the burglary with intent to commit the murder of Lieutenant Lotz. And all three were found by the court. So basically, uh, where you've got two people killed at the same time, this would uh, qualify uh, almost automatically for an aggravating factor. That is correct, Your Honor. That is correct. And then the members of the court are instructed they have to make those findings as to each of these aggravating factors, which in fact they did here, correct? They have to vote uh, with respect to each of the aggravating factors, but they only need to find at least one of the aggravating factors before they can go on and consider whether or not they want to impose the death penalty, weighing that aggravating factor, as well as other ag aggravating circumstances under Rule 1001 against all mitigating factors. So in this particular case, due to the particular circumstances, when they returned the finding of the two murders that had occurred at the same time, they really had already found one had found two of the aggravating factors, even at that point, although they had to go back and do it again during the sentencing proceeding. But that doesn't preclude them from still deciding that under the circumstances that they don't want to impose the death penalty. It wasn't preordained. At that stage, they have to find beyond a reasonable doubt each of the four elements of premeditated murder with respect to each murder. And the fact that we now go to sentencing, okay, does not preordain that death is going to be imposed. They it's may choose. It's a separate vote. It's a separate vote, Your Honor. It's a separate vote entirely. Now, if he, this, this offense occurred at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, if I recall correctly. And if, uh, Curtis had been tried in North Carolina in a state court, which I guess would have concurrent jurisdiction, there would have been a requirement that the jury find certain aggravating factors set by the state legislature. And I guess in any, uh, any other state, if there are similar circumstances, there would be aggravating circumstances or factors prescribed by the state legislature. And is it your argument basically that because of the unique relationship between the president and the Congress, that here, instead of having to have a legislative action, you have the president who is able to prescribe these aggravating factors? Yes, Your Honor, that is, that is part of it. Uh, in the first instance, we do have this uh, national defense that the federal government has been tasked uh, on, on behalf of the states. I mean, the states did, it, did give to the national government the authority to to raise and support armies and, and to provide rules and reg regulations for them. So this is a uniquely federal concern in the first instance. 
Secondly, uh, federal separation of powers law does not apply to the states. All of these cases which the, de the defense keeps bringing up uh, where they harp on how the state legislatures have been the ones who have enacted uh, the, uh, the aggravating factors or circumstances that the ca case may be, uh, ignore this essential difference between state law, and there's a point which the Justice Department's brief makes, which is that, that the states want it to. Uh, they have it within their power because federal separation of powers law does not apply to the states. They could, if they wanted to, uh, delegate to, say, say the Attorney General, but they cho chose not to. But in any event, federal separation of powers does not apply to the states. Federal se separation of powers law does apply to the federal government in addition to this unique concern of the national government, national defense, and the way that the, uh, the framers have divvied up the, the responsibilities between Congress and the President's Commander-in-Chief. Well, what I've been uh, concerned about throughout this case, the United States Supreme Court in Solario, the, it, it's an interesting question to me, has, has that case, has the United States Supreme Court given military justice a greater role in society and criminal justice other than just having a system to enhance morale and discipline. In other words, is a military justice system not only a system now to carry out the military purposes, but are we also a system which vindicates society for wrongs committed against society? I would say yes, Your Honor. If you recall back to O'Callaghan, one of the problems which members of the majority had was their perception that military justice was not sensitive to the constitutional night niceties which each well, member has. And yet, I, under I, under I understand that, but my point is this. It would seem to me that the President of the United States in his role as Commander-in-Chief would be perfectly competent to decide what is necessary within the rules that Congress has given him to play by. Yes, Your Honor. What is necessary to enhance morale and discipline? I guess the case of Private Slovak in the European theater is the most famous of those types of cases. But is the President, is the President, has, has Congress delegated to the President the power to vindicate this other aspect, the societal norm, where capital punishment is carried out to deter others or to have a retributive value or whatever purpose that we decide capital punishment should have? Is the President, absent a specific delegation of authority there, Now, this particular case involves a Marine, Lance Corporal, and a Lieutenant and his wife who was in the chain of command, as I understand. Is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And certainly an argument could be made that this is purely a military relationship. But also, as Judge Everett just pointed out, it's also, uh, if, if true, a heinous homicide in the state of North, heinous ho double homicide in the state of North Carolina. So there are certain societal purposes that the state of North Carolina would deem capital punishment appropriate. It may have nothing to do with the enhancement of morale and discipline in the Marine Corps, which is not seen necessary to use the death penalty to accomplish that in 200 years only. We have to remember that what we do in the military is kill people and break things. We are trained to do that. Now, if we let this training to kill people extend beyond uh, merely the battlefield and not in, impress upon I, I don't have any question that this is, you know, I, I'm not talking about the facts of this case. I'm talking about the president's power. Exactly. As, as commander in chief, he has responsibility for what his men do, his men and women do in the service. And as a commander in chief, he is, he is, he is responsible to the American people that they are trained and well, well trained to defend this country, but that they also should not use that training for an illegal purpose. And we would submit that by, uh, uh, by exercising the power delegated to him by Congress to narrow the, the cases in which the death penalty is going to be imposed, he has exercised that, that commander's authority to not only enforce discipline, but also to protect the larger community. And that's what we would submit, Your Honor. Going back to the President's authority as Commander-in-Chief, if the Congress had never enacted the Uniform Code of Military Justice, 
the president would not be able to assemble a court martial to try anybody for anything, could he? That is correct, Your Honor. Under our Constitution. So basically, the, the court martial that tried uh, the, the accused was convened pursuant to congressional authority, correct? That's correct, Your Honor. Just like our court sits pursuant to congressional mandate. Now, uh, isn't the real problem here that in all reality, Congress would not enact legislation which would authorize a death penalty for uh, uh, Corporal Curtis if they, were, if they had to enact it, if it had to go through the normal course of the legislative process? And here we have a situation where by delegating to the president, if they did delegate, uh, they really are passing off their responsibility to somebody else. And uh, hasn't the Supreme Court uh, said in cases like uh, INS against China that they can't do that? We would not submit that they've been doing that, Your Honor, because they were, they have been at all times cognizant of what the president was doing. And if they ever thought that it was somehow improper to do this because of the reporting back requirement of Article 36B, they would have taken action. So you're and saying when inaction on their part is the equivalent of action? Yes, no, Your Honor. That Th makes, you, make, you make your law by somebody doing something, reporting it to Congress, and Congress does not act. Mid Midwest Oil, Dames and Moore v. Reagan, v. Reagan excuse me, uh, congressional ac acquiescence over a long period of time uh, has been found to, to justify presidential action. And uh, we would submit that under these circumstances, we're not just going back to 1983 um, when RCM 1004 was being circulated. We're going back to 1950, 40 years of the president reporting back to the Congress what he has been doing, the manuals he's, cha the manuals he's promulgated, the changes he's made to those manuals, and Congress has always, in each instance, not objected. In effect, saying, good job, Mr. President. You're, you're exercising your authority as, as we have given to you. But of course, and I keep getting back to 106A, but it, it seems um, so much of, of, of the nail in the coffin as far as the government is concerned. There in 106A, they, they saw a gap in the code. No capital espionage. They found this gap. The president could not have prescribed that offense. That's substantive. That's for the Congress to do. They saw, saw the gap, and they plugged the gap. But in plugging the gap, they also said, but we like the procedure which we had, which you had promulgated under the authority delegated to you by us, implement the capital sentencing for someone convicted of this offense in accordance with that rule which you prom promulgated, expressly saying, good job, Mr. President. So That's what we would this say. this takes it out of inaction. This is positive approval. Yeah, there, there are two ways. There's, there's the implicit. Um, Judge Strickland, at page uh, 1083 of his brief, uh, or excuse me, of his opinion, uh, lay, lays that out very, very nicely, both the, the implicit uh, as well as the explicit intent of, of Congress that is represented by the reporting back and, and no objections rendered, as well as their actions in 106A. And we would submit that this is more than enough in order to satisfy uh, the, uh, the Constitution under delegation, doctrine, and separation of powers analysis. We submit that everything has been done. You're saying as far as separation of powers, this really isn't uh, uh, seizing power from Congress. That that's oh, not uh, at all, concerned yeah. with one branch trying to take power that the other one should have. And uh, here Congress has indicated uh, certainly that it does not view its power as being threatened by what the president has done. Not at all, sir. That's exactly the point. Now, that doesn't give president for free reign to violate other provisions of the Constitution, but we, as Lieutenant Commander Muskamp will argue, uh, he, he hasn't violated other provisions of the con Constitution in promulgating the rule. Um, but we do believe that it, it satisfies 
delegation doctrine analysis. It satisfies Mistretta. Footnote 11 can only be read the way appellant reads it if you have a guilt phase sentencing scheme. Because that's where the narrowing occurs in, say, say, Louisiana, where they include the aggravating factors in the elements of the offense. In Louisiana, in Louisiana, the difference between first degree murder and second degree murder is that under first degree murder, you've got to find at the guilt phase not only what would be the traditional elements of premeditated murder, but also these aggravating factors, which are then duplicated at the sentencing stage. That's the duplication that the court was talking about in Lowenfield, which was kind of unnecessary. But second degree murder, you would note, is the traditional elements of premeditated murder without the aggravating factors. If you're in a narrowing jurisdiction, then that's, that's perfectly fine. But this isn't. The vast majority are um, sentencing stage, uh, uh, capital sentencing schemes, such as RCM 1004, which don't affect the substance of the offense we would submit that it's constitutional. My red, red light's on, gentlemen. This honorable court's finding in Matthews that the president had been delegated the authority to promulgate capital sentencing proceedings has been confirmed by subsequent actions of Congress as well as by decisions of the Supreme Court. We would submit that this was a proper delegation, that this court was right in Matthews, and on this basis, this, um, the judgment of the court below should be affirmed. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Madam Musha. Good morning, Your Honor. So, I'm the Ten Commander Muskamp, and I will um, address the second issue, uh, the constitutionality of RCM 1004 on its face. Uh, our understanding of Appellant's argument is that he assails the constitutionality of this rule on three grounds. The first is that we haven't handled our mitigation properly. The second is that he finds a constitutional defect and a lack of any provision for comparative proportionality review. And the third is uh, uh, he alleges that a sentencing provision such as ours must necessarily include, in order to be constitutionally lawful, a requirement for a 12-member vote. Uh, that is the order in which Appellant addressed them in his brief. And although I noticed that he reversed that order in his presentation today, I will pursue the original order unless directed otherwise. Uh, with respect to the uh, argument on the mitigating factors, uh, again, these break down into uh, three distinct arguments as we understand the appellant's position. Uh, the first uh, argument appears to be uh, that the president should have and failed to specify mitigating factors as uh, some state statutes do, including, for instance, the California, Pennsylvania, uh, North Carolina and others, and uh, that um, uh, that consequently, or as a, part, possibly as a separate and distinct argument, uh, there is a failure on the part of the trial judge to instruct adequately to guide the 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 discretion of the members in arriving at a determination not only with respect to the identification of these factors and also with respect to how they should be balanced against the aggravating factors which they have already found by unanimous vote. And lastly, as we understand the argument, it is that uh, the, uh, there is a danger that an absence of instruction might mislead the members as to whether or not there is a required unanimous concurrence as to uh, the mitigating factors and that he suggests that uh, uh, the members in this case possibly might even have been misled in this fashion. Uh, addressing then the first of these uh, contentions, uh, we would submit it's much too late in the day, uh, especially after Lockett versus Ohio and Eddings versus Oklahoma, for any argument that uh, the crucial discretion narrowing function which the Supreme Court mandated in Furman versus Georgia need be done or should be done, possibly even can be done constitutionally by resort to mitigating factors as opposed to aggravating factors. As Justice Scalia has pointed out in the most recent decision, his concurring opinion in Walton versus Arizona, 
the Supreme Court's jurisprudence has essentially elaborated a counter doctrine that while the narrowing function is performed exclusively by these aggravating factors which have to be identified by some competent body, in our case the president, and have to be voted upon unanimously by the jury or the members, uh, that with respect uh, to mitigating factors, the more, the less explicit, uh, uh, the, the more amorphous, the better. So in fact, what appellant assaults here in his argument is a virtue, not a defect of our scheme. Everything and anything can be considered in, in, as an extenuating or mitigating feature. Anything that the appellant chooses to offer as a reason supporting a decision for something less than the death penalty. And so in other words, uh, as I understand it, uh, the current doctrine of the Supreme Court, as you explained at least, is that uh, there should not be an enumeration by a legislature of mitigating factors. That it should be, uh, that, that imposes undue rigidity. It locks in the jury uh, and that it instead they should be said, consider whatever you think mitigating and, uh, and then balance that against aggravating and see how you come out. It always presents that danger, as, uh, as Your Honor knows in, in the statutes which were challenged in Blystone versus Pennsylvania and Boyd versus California, these schemes incorporated not only specific aggravating factors but also specific mitigating factors and the, the, uh, the danger was that the emphasis of what constitutes a statutorily identified mitigating factor might tend to denigrate or rather derogate from the authority and the force of some other mitigating factor which the defendant had to offer which had not been enumerated in the statute. And in both of those cases, the Supreme Court was able to, uh, made it quite clear that had the state laws not incorporated a catch-all provision which permitted the defendant essentially to make his locket showing, his or Eddings actually, since uh, Lockett was only plurality vote and Eddings versus Oklahoma embraced Lockett and made it the majority decision. Uh, and, which means essentially that any matter, any factor affecting his background, personal circumstances, his history, uh, the circumstances surrounding the offense, anything he chose to present should be and could be presented. And it was because those states had those catch-all provisions that the court upheld uh, the, uh, those state statutes from the alleged constitutional infirmity which might otherwise have obtained. If I am an individual court member trying a military accused, how do I balance? Or what, what does the judge tell me? How do I balance these things, judge? Well, what he would have told you in this case, uh, uh, which is an il illustration, we think, an apt illustration of how these factors will be handled in the military, is that the defendant has presented evidence pertaining to his youth. He was adopted. He was originally a foster no, child. That's not what I mean. I'm, what I'm saying is, let's assume that I'm, I come out and say, Judge, I'm the president of the court. I'll just tell you right now, we're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he committed these crimes. We're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that the aggravating factors are present. And we are unanimous. Mm -hmm. Now, we've got nine of us here, and we've got a varying opinions on these mitigating things you've been telling mm -hmm. us about. How do we deal with these things, Judge? You preserve your varying opinions and apply them as, you as each particular member in his own conscience sees fit. Uh, that appears to be the inescapable understanding of the military scheme. Okay. Is that what the military judge instructed them? Absolutely. We would submit that appellant has presented a red herring in this, uh, in, in, in this courtroom. And in drawing upon Mills versus Maryland and McCoy versus North Carolina, those states presented the, the danger that they did to which the Supreme Court reacted as it did because they were a tripartite, a three-step voting procedure. In the first instance, under the state law, the, the jury had to select an aggravating factor by unanimous vote. The second and distinct step is they had to select by vote, a, by concurrence, uh, unanimous concurrence, specifically under uh, North, Carolina law, North Carolina law and uh, implicitly under Maryland law, the mitigating factor. And thirdly, and not until the third stage, would they then balance the aggravating factors they had found against the mitigating factors they had also found. Now, we have a two-step procedure. We don't have a vote in which there is a concurrence 
in which there needs to be a concurrence, or a concurrence could be established with respect to mitigating factors. Because such a distinct vote, such a stage is lacking, there is no opportunity for the situation which the Supreme Court majority posited in those two cases of a holdout juror preventing the, any consideration being given to mitigating factors at the third and crucial balancing stage because it had been not voted on unanimously by the jury in the second uh, mitigating or extenuating factor determination stage. Now, that presented the problem because whether it was a single holdout uh, juror or perhaps even a substantial minority of holdout jurors, under those two effective state schemes, such a vote meant that a factor that was not selected was a factor that was rejected. If it was a factor that rejected, then surely it could not be relied upon for the balancing, for, for, the, for the third and final balancing vote. Now, we don't have that difficulty because our scheme, our, the structure of our voting uh, procedure does not contemplate such a second vote at all. Therefore, the members have no opportunity, although presumably in the course of uh, uh, their, their deliberations in the jury, they will talk and undoubtedly some kind of consensus will evolve as to what, what mitigating factors were demonstrated, what extenuating factors were, extenu were demonstrated, and how they should be weighed. But there is no opportunity, no requirement that they arrive at any concurrence with respect to those factors, and therefore no possibility that any member will feel he cannot give weight to that factor in the balancing stage. Well, what bothers me about, and I've got to study the chart, this is, this is not this particular, uh, I'm not talking about the, I am talking about the facts of the case, I don't mean to, but it looks like that the jury is instructed here that if they're convinced beyond a reasonable doubt of the existence of the aggravating circumstances, unanimously, yes, Your Honor. then they can impose the death penalty. Oh, no, Your Honor. They are also told next that that is a precondition, just like the Georgia scheme, which was examined uh, most fully in Zant versus Stevens. They are in, in instructed that the aggravating factor determination stage is a condition precedent to <coughs> making, to rendering that particular defendant before them death eligible. That's the eligibility stage. I mean, he has. He, he, certainly a death penalty is possible in his case because he has been convicted of homicide and he has been convicted by, a, uh, by a, a unanimous vote. Those are also two preconditions before they can even arrive at uh, a, a, a death penalty phase. But the, the, the point in time, just as uh, in the, the Georgia scheme, which we emulate most closely, that they qualify this person as a possible, as a candidate for death, is when they select that aggravating factor, which is simply a factual determination, much, very much akin like the, the determinations they make in the guilt and innocence phase. Now, having rendered him eligible for the death penalty, they are then left to their discretion, completely to their discretion, even in the, the Georgia uh, scheme in Zant versus Stevens, as to whether or not a proper moral response uh, to the gravity of his crimes as extenuated and mitigated by such circumstances, personal or otherwise, as he has, he, as he has been able to exhibit, uh, death should be imposed. And there, they can consider everything and anything, and that is the virtue of our system. The kind of impediment that the Supreme Court faced in Penry versus uh, uh, Lynor, and uh, in Franklin versus Lynor, and uh, in uh, the Skipper versus uh, 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 Skipper versus Cartwright, and 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 those cases where the members would receive evidence, the jury would receive evidence about a uh, a mitigating factor, but then would be instructed in such a manner that they would either have to discount those factors entirely, or at least they would not be plugged into any just consideration of those factors, simply cannot arise in the military. Not because RCM 1004 makes any provision for it, but because military procedure 
has, does not begin and end with RCM 1004. Uh, uh, the rule doesn't displace or supplant existing sentencing procedures. Military procedure has always made provision for tailoring instructions under the rules of this honorable court with respect to sentencing information. That is, a military judge is always required to tailor his sentencing instructions according to the evidentiary presentation that has been uh, uh, made by the defense. That to include extenuation and mitigation. Absolutely. And it was done in this case at, at the record at uh, Absolutely. 822 and, uh, to, uh, and it, to 25. And it appears to have been done fairly because we note no objection to it, nor was there any suggestion from defense counsel uh, that anything more should be added. So merely to the extent that it is worth anything, the lack of an objection here uh, indicates that the, 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 the fairness, the summation was, was an accurate and, and, and adequate one. And the judge did that instruction pursuant to uh, 1004. No, he did that because instruction. Because it says instructions, the judge, the judge shall instruct the members that they must consider all evidence and extenuation and mitigation before they may judge death. Well, absolutely. They made that, that instruction, of course, we would submit, also embraces existing military procedure. He, he, he is not limited by uh, his reference to... But it's mentioned in, in the... Absolutely, Your Honor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, he can, it is unavoidably uh, presented to the trial judge that he must instruct and he must instruct on mitigating factors. And the members were so instructed. And it is inescapable in any court martial under this provision that they would be so instructed, especially inescapable under the precedence of this honorable court itself. So there is the, uh, the instructional requirement that uh, has been around for quite a while that the, uh, the military judge must inform the, the members of the court martial about mitigating and extenuating circumstances, what they signify, give some illustrations, that type of thing. Absolutely. That has been the practice, uniform practice of the military since the early 60s. Right. Well, maybe you better move on to those other two uh, arguments. Very well, then. I believe, actually, that covers the mitigation issue or the alleged defects with our procedures uh, in, in that respect. Uh, the next argument he maintains is the lack of a proportionality review. And uh, the government submits, as uh, and, uh, we believe, that the appellant does not dispute that this is not an issue of constitutional significance. Uh, the Supreme Court has, in Pulley versus Harris, and in subsequent cases, McCleskey versus Kemp, or Walton versus Arizona, uh, indicated that uh, these are not, uh, that this is not a constitutionally sourced requirement. Some states have adopted on their own, as Georgia did. Uh, I'm sorry, as, as Florida did. In some instances, the state has imposed it by statute, as is in the case uh, of the state of Georgia. The mere fact that some states have embraced it by statute and others have left it to the Supreme Court of their jurisdiction uh, to make provision for it is insignificant. We would submit that to the extent this honor court deems it necessary and appropriate in a given case to adopt some form of proportionality review, uh, this honorable court will surely do so or instruct other bodies, inferior bodies, to do so on, in, in its stead. Uh, Helen seems to suggest, uh, I believe it is well placed somewhere in a footnote, that perhaps this honorable court lacks the authority to adopt some form of proportionality review, even if it chooses to do so, because these are questions of fact and not questions of law. But well, we would submit that there's no support for that in the precedence when the Supreme Court has addressed this procedure. It has always spoken of it in terms of uh, a uh, normal adjunct of appellate review. Uh, and indeed, in some instances of uh, a review at the trial level uh, in a, in a post-judgment ju post, uh, motion. Uh, so, the, however this honorable court chooses to handle this particular matter, uh, the government has, uh, does not see the matter of, of, of one, uh, as one of constitutional magnitude. There can be no argument that it is required. There is a provision, and uh, there was a remark in Pulley versus Harris that if, there, if the system is otherwise so deficient, it can be rescued from uh, the possibility of arbitrary or capricious results uh, by a uh, proportionality review, and indeed, uh, uh, that, that, that there may be some cases at some point in some states where that will uh, apply. But we would submit that there are no such deficiencies uh, in, in our system, and that therefore this honorable court is not required to adopt such a procedure at all. And would you believe uh, it? I'm sorry. Uh, let's see. Article 106 has been suggested by the other side to be a, a correct 
pr way to proceed. But that doesn't have a proportionality requirement in it, does it? Well, it has a kind of a de facto proportionality requirement uh, uh, because uh, in, in the, the, the courts of military view, we have to make some determination on the appropriateness of the sentence. And as this honorable court has pointed out in, in most recently in Ballard, it is very difficult to make a determination as to sentence appropriateness without some reference to what other persons in similar positions uh, have received in terms of a sentence. So there is a kind of a de facto inescapable proportionality review as, as part of Article 30, 66. So well, as I understand, it, the government uh, has no question that this court, to whatever extent it feels that's uh, either constitutionally mandated or otherwise appropriate, would have the power to make such determinations of proportionality as uh, would be required in order to assure that there was nothing out of line between the death penalty imposed on Curtis or, say, on an airman or a soldier or a Coast Guard member. Would that be the position? Absolutely not, Your Honor. In, in fact, we note that the remark, the dissenting uh, remarks of Judge Byrne below probably could be understood as an exercise of proportionality, comparative proportionality review. Uh, however, we understand that the Amici for the Justice Department will present argument as to why this court's adoption of such a system might be unwise because of perhaps because of the difficulty uh, 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 and the, the, the magnitude of the task. And we leave that argument to him since he's much better positioned to make it than we. Uh, moving on then to the third and final argument that the Pellant has presented by which he began his uh, 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 address here, uh, the, the, the alleged constitutional requirement for 12-member jury. It's very difficult for us to respond to that because uh, we, um, we uh, don't quite know where, where, where he finds its source. Uh, he has spoken in the course of his address here that, um, that there is a, a social, societal consensus uh, that a jury of with less than 12 uh, would be inadequate. We presume by that societal consensus, he means that the legislatures of all the states which have a death penalty system have not chosen to experiment with a less than 12 member uh, jury in those situations. Uh, that simply is a, uh, a, a, a political curiosity. Uh, the Supreme Court has always recognized that each state is kind of a laboratory in which it may experiment with various uh, various forms of procedure and substantive law as it deems just and appropriate, and it appears that no state has chosen to do so. But to, to, to distill from that a principle that can be transported into the universe of the Uniform Code of Military uh, Justice uh, procedure would seem to be uh, misguided, because there are many and some very fundamental differences between the two. We do not draw from that uh, from, the, from the civilian sector, unexamined the precepts which guide uh, legislatures there. There are sufficient reasons sometimes why the military has to do with more and sometimes why it has to do with less. Generally, we think we do with more and we are not faulted for that. In this particular case, there's some very pragmatic reasons uh, why uh, the, the, the Congress has selected a, a grand jury sentencing procedure of five men and fully contemplated that it adjudicate a death penalty. Uh, there may well be an evolving consensus in the civilian jurisdictions uh, that a 12-member jury is, is a minimum requirement or that ought to adjudicate a death penalty, but we would submit that that does not arrive, certainly not at this juncture in our history, as a constitutional mandate under the Eighth Amendment. We do know, don't we, that certain things can only be done by a certain number of people, as it were, that a state court jury uh, cannot go below six, as I understand it. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, and isn't he arguing uh, by analogy that in a capital case, a state court case could not go below 12 and that this uh, given the ramifications of cruel and unusual punishment under the Eighth Amendment should be implied in uh, federal law as a federal constitutional guarantee? Isn't that basically the argument? I, possibly that is the argument, and probably it should be uh, addressed to this honorable court when this court has a jury, a
Honorable Court, when this court has a jury, a, a member which has sentenced someone with five or less than six members. In this case, obviously, uh, the, uh, the, 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 there were nine members. It initially, the members panel consisted of 15. There were three challenges by the defense, two challenges for cause by the uh, prosecution. Then the prosecution exercised its peremptory challenge. Uh, the defense significantly did not exercise its peremptory challenge. So we must presume that as the court was then constituted, it seemed reasonably decent to the defense counsel. If there were no strikes, uh, we would have wound up here with a 15-member panel. Absolutely, Your Honor. Uh, we noticed that the Air Force uh, argument has uh, the, uh, a recent uh, uh, brief filed by the Air Force has attempted to make a virtue out of uh, a, a defect out of this virtue uh, by suggesting that well, it could very well be 50 or 500, and that then introduces an element of caprice. Well, we would submit that there will be very rare occasions when this honorable court will address a jury, a, a death sentence adjudicated by 50 or 500. And when, when it sees such a case, it will be time enough to address that particular problem. Your Honor, I believe I'm out of my time. Possibly I've even trespassed upon a few additional minutes. And I would thank you. Thank you, Commander. I believe this is the appointed time for, uh, for a uh, luncheon recess, and uh, we'll be uh, resuming at 2 o'clock. There will be uh, initially, I believe, uh, five uh, amici representing uh, the defense position, and four, as I recall, representing the government position. And then there will be an opportunity for rebuttal by, I believe, first the government and then the appellant. And uh, that will be the schedule for this afternoon reconvening at 2 o'clock. We'll recess for lunch. You've just seen live coverage of arguments before the United States Court of Military Appeals. This has been the first live telecast of arguments in a federal appellate court. The Court of Military Appeals was established under a different article of the Constitution than other federal courts and is not subject to camera restrictions outlined by the Judicial Conference of the U.S. Our live coverage of arguments in the case of U.S. versus Curtis continues at 2 p.m. Eastern Time with oral presentations by those who have filed briefs in the case. Stay with us now for more taped programming about the U.S. Court of Military Appeals. Good day from Washington. You're watching C-SPAN and we'll take a break now for information about programs.